Hey there, good evening. Nice to see you. It's always nice to see you. It's time for the Bronx Buzz. This is BronxNet's program where we talk to reporters and writers and editors, journalists of all kinds. So you can kind of find out what's going on behind the scenes of the scenes that we all read about. In our second segment today, a wonderful story about a mural in one of the Bronx hospitals. Uh, and uh, you'll see that it's um, <clears throat> it's a larger project than just a painting. But now let's get started. Let's say hello to Leo G. Miranda. He's formerly a reporter at the Mott Haven Herald and Hunts Point Express, now a reporting intern with something called Next City, which he was just describing to me. Leo, nice to see you, my friend. Nice to see you too, Gary. And thanks for having me on. I really sure. appreciate it. Um, just a little bit of background, since people um, don't don't know you, um, you um, were always interested in journalism. Somebody knocked on your door and said, "Hey, maybe you could do this." I mean, how, how did you get How'd you get into this mess? You know, uh, grew up in Brooklyn. One parent was a school teacher. The other parent is, uh, you know, human social services, uh, working city government. And so I think I always had like a civic duty mind. Okay. Um, and journalism was something that was percolating in there for a long time. Um, and I was working as a substitute teacher uh, during the pandemic and a little bit after the pandemic. And uh, I saw the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. Um, I'll be finishing up there in the fall and I applied. And I just love their mission of sort of, you know, journalism as a public good, as giving back to the community, as accountability, and I sort of jumped at the opportunity, and 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 here I am. Well, it's interesting because some um, people, some young journalists that we have talked to, said, "Oh no, in high school I was writing for the school paper." But it sounds like your journey was not that, but a light bulb uh, lit up there somewhere, and you said, "Wow, maybe I ought to do this." Uh, so, what's it been like? Um, I mean, you you moved on already, so one would think this is something that you uh, really want to do. Yeah, it's been really exciting. Um, you know, the people that I've met, the journalists, the people I've been able to talk to, you know, sources, it's so enriching to be able to talk to people and learn from them. Dude, you're preaching to the choir. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean, what I'm you, you, yeah, of course. It's, you know, to find out what's really going on. I am curious. Now, you're a guy from Brooklyn, but you covered the Bronx. Uh, any impressions of the Bronx uh, before we get into a couple of uh, specifics that you yeah. have written about? Yeah, it was a great pleasure to be, re be able to report on the Bronx just for about six months. So I didn't get to everything, of course. OK, um, but, you know, it's vibrant. It's got all, you know, all kinds of food and great, some great parks. Um I'm, I'm waiting for you to say amazing people, right? All the people you met and talked yeah, to. They... People, right. That's right. No, all the people I met and talked to were great. And, um, you know, you walk around and you just get so much from, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm a New Yorker too. So you walk around, that's kind of how you experience the city. So I'm walking around the Bronx in Mott Haven, mostly um, Hunts Point as well, uh, walking around and kind of talking to people and figuring out what's going on. Was, yeah, and was, you, know, you know what I always say about the Bronx and again, I won't cast any aspersions about Brooklyn. You can do whatever you want. Nobody knows we're here. It's like still undiscovered territory. And I mean, I've been doing Bronx TV for 30 years, so I've, I've seen it all. But I, every time I have conversations or even the conversation we're about to have, I'm like, no, nobody knows. Somebody told me the other day, they, they're from New Jersey, and they said, how come when I read about the Bronx, you know, I see fires and I see crime, I said, let me ask you something. We got 1.4 million people here. You think that's all we are? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? We're all criminals? Anyway, listen, You, I thought this was fascinating for a couple of reasons. You wrote a story called The Push is On for a Community-Driven Pedestrian Bridge Linking Hunts Point and Soundview. What I found was fascinating is the idea came from one per uno, from one person, somebody named Derek Holman. Tell us a little bit about what this proposal is and, of course, where it came from. Yeah, that's right. So Derek Holman, he's just a, he's a resident of Soundview and just actually, a Bronx guy, right? Just a Bronx guy. He's now subsequently on the community board in, in district nine. So Soundview's community. Board. Okay. But basically um, it's a pedestrian bridge that would connect Hunts Point and Soundview um, from Hunts Point Riverside park. It's a small little, park right on this industrial strip along right. the uh, Bronx River and it'd go over to Soundview sort of the top of Soundview Park is where it would connect and Soundview Park's this huge really lovely park I'm sure of many of you um, 
uh, have have experience, have great experiences there, and it's really not that, that accessible if you live in, over in Hunts Point. How how park. long a bridge would this have to be? And and I'm I'm would like to make the assumption that it would include, for example, a bike lane or bike lanes as well. Right. Yes. So the the push is for a pedestrian and bicycle bridge that would span the Bronx River there. Um, and sorry, what was your other question? Uh, it, it basically, how long is it? And, right. and uh, you know, um, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to gauge how realistic it is. I know that Council Member Farias was very interested. Yes. Um, but but so how long, I, you know, I'm, I looked at a map. It's, it's, you know, it's an interesting concept. It is, yeah. So I don't know exactly how far it is. It's um, probably less than 100 yards is what I would say. But it could wow. be more. I'm not like that. The part there it depends okay. on like how swell. Well, but that, but that gives us some perspective. So a hundred, you think about this: a hundred yards would Maybe a connect. More or less, yeah, w- would make one park, two parks, would connect two communities in the Bronx. And of course, we have issues with isolationism, and you know, people they live in their own neighborhood, and they don't know what's going on in another neighborhood. I mean, it's win-win to me. Yeah. I mean, Just to be clear for everyone listening the it's he's pushing for a Derek Holman is pushing for a feasibility study and there's been some buzz uh as you mentioned council city council majority leader Farias who represents uh Soundview among other neighborhoods right um she supports the project she she gave her comment to to us at the Mount Haven Herald saying all good by us and that it would be a great way to uh, connect these communities sustainability um and the Department of City Planning, which has been um, working on the new, the four proposed- The Metro North, North stations North over there, exactly. yeah. As part of that whole project, oh. they mentioned uh, in January that they're going to be actually looking into um, connecting this type of pedestrian. Right. And and so what, what is fascinating to me, um, because what's been spinning in my head throughout this whole dialogue, and even after reading your- uh, your piece is um, it costs money. Now I know um, you may not be aware of this up in the North Bronx. Uh, there was talk about a pedestrian bridge um, linking two halves of Van Cortland Park over the uh, Major Deegan Expressway, and I can't even tell you how many hurdles <laughs> has it it's gone through. And it, you know, is the money was proposed, and then of course they waited too long, and then that's not going to be enough money, and we don't need to get into that. Um, but if you say it's part of the Metro North project, there's money in there, right? right? So, so, so it's not like they may need an extra outlay. They may need to just apportion what they have for this part of that project. Right. From what I understand, the DCP just said that they're looking into it. So okay. it's possible to look into the feasibility. That was the wording. So yeah, and, possible and the, that study officially comes out, you know, sometime and, and as part of that larger project. Right. And then well, we is the funding there for it within that project or elsewhere? Right, right. Um, you know, this feasibility study is always a fascinating thing. It, it's a way of moving projects forward and sometimes a way of delay, <laughs> delaying a, uh, a concept. So anyway, I thought it was fascinating. I thought you really unveiled something that I had not known about. This is the vital importance of um, uh, local um uh, local journalism, right. uh, you know, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking uh, renovations to concrete park, Garrison Park, Starlight Park are accomplishments of, of that plan. Um, let's just talk about uh, another article, which I thought um, was also fascinating. It was a couple of months ago was this idea of preference for local residents and affordable housing about to change. Um, just talk about that because development and affordable housing in the lowest, uh, sec- lowest, I mean, geographically lowest sections of the Bronx is a very big question. Yeah, absolutely. Just super quick on that last uh, story. Yeah. The one thing I also wanted to bring home was in Hunts Point, for people who live there, they know this, there's not many parks. It's only about 3% of the land area of Hunts Point and Longwood. Um our green space. So that would, it wouldn't greatly increase. And that's sort of what. That, that's what I said, make one park, two parks. And certainly for the people in that part of the Bronx to have access to the huge uh, sound view park, of course, right. would, would be great. Anyway, back to uh, affordable housing. So on this story, so I co-reported it with another colleague of mine, Christine right. Zeiger, brilliant reporter, 
check her out on the Monty Heaven Herald and Hunts Point Express. She does great work there. Um, and basically for this story, we're talking about the New York City housing lottery. So that's the one where you apply online. They kind of pick your name out of a hat. You have to be eligible uh, be, you know, with your income level, of amount course. of people in your household. There's a couple other requirements, right? right? So it used to be for many, many years, 50% of the units in any one of these buildings could be held for people in the district, right? So if you're applying for a, if you live in Mott Haven and you apply for a building in Mott Haven, there's 50% of those units in that building that would be set aside. Set basically. aside for you. This, smaller, this, of course, is very, very important, in, right. in particularly in this neighborhood. Right. So like you would be able to to apply for those units, which are, which are going to be within a smaller pool of applicants. Right. So because of a federal the settlement city settled with a federal lawsuit, um, that number because of the settlement, that number for, of the 50 percent number is now going to be reduced to 20 percent. Uh, in a few years, it'll be reduced further to 15 percent. Basically, you, you couldn't see it on camera at that moment, but Gary just took. Yeah. Very big sigh. So basically the lawsuit, um, which was called Winfield versus the city of New York, um, the plaintiffs, um, in the end, at least, were two black New Yorkers who basically the lawsuit alleged that the community preference policy, which is that policy that we're talking about, the 50 percent being right. held people within the district, basically promoted segregation. Uh, it had a segregatory effect. Um, on, on, I, I'm going to do my checkbox on that. Yes. So, you know, um, the way I understood it was, you know, if you live in an area that's historically low income, you don't have much income, um, and you would like to live in another area. The only play, the only way you might be able to, to, to move into that area. That's a, that's a, that's a very high income area might be through something like the New York city housing lottery. Therefore, if 50% of those units are held for people within the district, maybe you, would you be got a better chance. Uh, we're going to run out of time. I will just recommend anybody who uh, wonders what it looks like down there. Just go uh, look at the Bankside project and so many other projects. If you drive south on the Major Deegan and look to your right, you'll say, wait a minute. This didn't used to look like this. And then you get some of what uh, uh, what Leo is talking about. Listen, Leo, good luck at Next City. Uh, we're going to look for more of the stuff that you uh, write. And uh, certainly if you have anything about the Bronx that you think we're interested in, make sure we see it. We want to uh, know what you're doing because you are one of the great young reporters that we need desperately in our borough. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. And I implore everybody, if you want great young new reporters, look at Mott Haven Herald, Hunts Point Express. They've got a whole team of people who are, are following some of these stories as we speak. And we've had many of them on the air and we'll continue to do so. Leo Miranda, um, great. It's a pleasure to meet you and pleasure to have you on uh, the Bronx Buzz uh, this evening. Thank you so much, Gary. I really appreciate great. it. Uh, we're going to take a short break. And as I said, a mural in a hospital. Why are we taking the time? You'll see in a moment. Don't go away.
Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. We're always excited to show you new art stuff in the Bronx, and this is particularly unique and important. And uh, so we will say a good evening to the care experience officer at North Central Bronx Hospital. That is Alicia Braun. Alicia, nice to be with you. Nice to see you. Hello. Thank you for having me. And um, an artist, an artiste. It is Sophia Victor. Sophia, thank you for taking the time to be with us. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Uh, Alicia, I'm, I was talking about how unusual it is to have a mural painted in a hospital, but apparently I'm somewhat wrong because you, you folks at NCB and um, uh, the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation have been doing this. Tell us about the large waves of healing, and then we'll focus in on what's going on at NCB. Right. So New York City Health and Hospitals has had arts in their facilities for many, many years now, and we continue to build through our community mural project, um, which is something that we're going to get into with the mural that we just completed at North Central Bronx. So you'll find many different pieces um, throughout our hospitals and throughout all of our facilities across New York City. And it's thought to be one of the largest art collections um, in New York City. So I encourage everyone to check it out and see what pieces we have available. Absolutely. Um, and let's hope you're checking it out as a visitor and not as a patient. But if you are, that's okay too. Um, but what, what, why would, um, now I, I got the numbers here since 2019, which take, makes it five years. And there are 37 murals created at um, New York City Health and Hospitals. What, what, why is a hospital a good place for a mural? Right. So when you think about experience, you think about the senses. What do you see? What do you feel? What do you hear? What do you smell when you're walking into any establishment, but much less a hospital? It's not known to be the happiest place um, and so what the Community Mural Project does and what artwork in the hospital does is bring some brightness, some vibrancy to our hospital spaces and then it can really help with our patients and our staff to minimize the levels of stress that they are feeling. You know, seeing a beautiful piece of artwork can immediately change your emotions, can change your thought process. And that is why we have been working so hard to put these beautiful pieces throughout all of our facilities to create that experience for our patients, our visitors, and our first staff members. I got two questions to follow up with. One is the value of art in healing. Um, people, uh, you, you correctly, of course, mentioned that people in hospitals have all kinds of stress. Even the people visiting have uh, plenty of stress very often. Um, and, and, I guess it's welcoming, right? Maybe you could talk a little bit more um, uh, eloquently than I can about, um, you know, why this really works in, in this kind of a setting. There has been many, many studies that have been done, and New York City Health and Hospitals Arts and Medicine team has done a lot of research themselves on the effect of artwork within healthcare, um, not just art, but music um, and all things that fall into the arts category. And so we try to incorporate these things within our facilities, again, for both patients and staff members to help with stress levels, um, to help with whatever they may be going through at the time, and just, again, to beautify our spaces. Um, you, the other question I have is almost a personal one. I, it's so interesting. I introduced you as the care experience officer. So this is really, this shows as if we need to have it demonstrated that NCB and New York City hospitals um, really, really, they want, they want to make the experience um, uh, healthful and so that people are shown that that you actually care about them. And it, it's not like it is a bureaucracy. We know that. But that there's real care. There's real human beings behind it. Absolutely. We want to create a healing environment um, for anyone that's coming in. And we want to create something that our patients and our staff members can see themselves in. We are a community hospital in the Norwood community in the Bronx. And we want what we put up in our hospitals to be relatable to the people that we serve. 
Right, so that they feel uh, welcome. Sophia, I um, first of all, just your own background as an artist, and then we're going to talk specifically about this project. Okay, cool. So tell tell us about you as an artist. You've been painting for a long time. You've done murals. Um, just a little background. Yeah. So by the grace of God, I've been making art for over twenty years, Good and um, uh, it was kind of a gift that I stumbled on. I wasn't really interested in art in the beginning, and then ended up. Uh, getting accepted for LaGuardia High School for Art. And little by little, God revealed to me that I had a gift. And um, as soon as I discovered that I could paint, my dad got me enrolled in a mural program ah. um, that still exists in Brooklyn. So I went from working on you know 18 by 24 to immediately transforming community centers. And this was happening at like the age of 15. And so- wow. Working big and community art practices and mural projects has been a part of my practice for a long uh, time. For a long uh, time. And yeah. and um, this project, um, you know what? Maybe Anderson, let's just show pictures so we're not talking like people don't know what we're talking about. Here it is. <laughs> Here it is. Yes. yes. What, what what do you think about when you look up and see it now, even in this context? Uh, I I don't know. It's like it's always really exciting to see the finished product. Um, as the artist and like the lead artist in something like this, I feel like the process is a lot more for me. And then the product is for everyone who will see it for forever. Um, well, but then that's, also that's a, that, excuse me. That's a wonderful perspective. So the process is my, is like my, I got to deal with that. It's a but, pretty intimate process, you know, I, but, but I, like I, I want to ask you about that specifically in this case, um, and, and I don't know which one of you is better able to explain it. You asked for community input as to what should oh, yeah. be in there. Right. Um, so Alicia, um, maybe you could just talk about that. And then we'll talk to Sophia about hearing all that and then figuring out how to, how to do it. Yes. Yeah. So we had um, several focus groups going into this session and this project which consisted of members of our staff at the hospital and members of the community and our community advisory board who represents our community. And we, Sophia did an amazing job of taking all of our input. Um, we had different art homework and art lessons um, and we put together our own art pieces and Sophia was able to take elements of all of those pieces and put it together into this wow. mural. And so, anyone who's walking past we definitely see a piece of ourselves and our hospital in and, that and of course they see themselves in the community uh, alicia give us one example or two examples of what people ask for oh the waves the waves the blue waves, waves. that <laughs> seems to be consistent in our to poetry writing and transported somewhere else. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so then, uh, Sophia, um, as opposed to you creating the, the whole thing, how much of a challenge is that for you to get kind of conscripted to yeah. say you've got to create it like this? This is what we want. Well, this this is more like the design process is truly collaborative. Yeah, Anderson, right? and pop so, the like, thing up there so we can enjoy seeing it more. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm so sorry. the design process was truly a collaborative process. Um, I, I just finished um, obtaining a master's in art therapy. So I try to be really mindful and sensitive to like what everyone in the room needs and wants, not just in like, what do you want to see in the mural, but like, how do they feel comfortable approaching art? Especially, you know, if someone has never painted before or made any type of art before. So we really worked with, um, we worked with like oil pastels, we worked with collage and how we started, I would just ask everyone, hey, like, what is it that you want to see or feel when you look at this piece? Because if I never come back to this hospital, you know, at the end of the day, you guys are here every day. This is your mural. Right. And so they would shout out hope and we want to feel happy. We want to see smiling faces. Um, wow. We want to see community diversity. So and they and then. Yeah. And, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt because we always end up running out of time because we get so yeah, yeah, involved. Yeah, go ahead. But um, uh, and then you worked with it like you didn't just paint it. There were other people painting it. So it was a community. Uh, Alicia. Yeah. Yeah. Say, so yeah. those words turned into a bunch of images, which they also came up with. And then they put those images together and then I reworked their design. And then we had a paint party, which was a lot of fun. I've, I've done co community paint days, but. 
this is the most organized, clean, fun, wow. thin dropout. Well, so if you could imagine a giant coloring book of the mural and a bunch of people grabbing a color and kind of like what what, what a what a great metaphor, a giant coloring book. Um, I, you know, did anybody step in the bucket? I hate no, that. I hate thank that. God, <laughs> thank God. I saw the carpet on the floor and I was like, oh Lord. No, oh no, no, we're gonna make a mess. No fills, oh, no crazy accidents. Maybe next time we should extend the mural to the floor so that the, the carpet is covered. <laughs> yes. um, Alicia, what kinds of responses have you gotten? Have you gotten any responses? Do you do you get the sense that it's been a successful project? It has definitely been a successful project. The responses have been very positive from the time the mural went up even until now everyone that's seeing it has nothing but great things to say they're so happy again to see themselves and the community and the people that they serve in this mural yeah especially people who may have actually contributed it or painted it or all those kinds of things where where in the hospital is it I, i'd like to come by and see it i assume the general yeah. public it can Absolutely. It is located on the third floor okay. of our hospital. And this was strategically placed because the third floor, we have many of our outpatient practices where mm -hmm. there is tons of foot traffic. A lot of our patients are coming in to see their doctors um, on the third floor. We, where we have a lot of our outpatient services. And so we wanted it to be an area where a lot of people would be able to view this piece. And again, right. See themselves in it. Yeah, I, I think it's great. And I think about, you know, medical facilities maybe that I've been through and not, not at NCB, but um, in other places. And I, I wonder how I would feel if I walked in and saw and, and you could see there were, you know, real human beings in there. Of course, there's diversity in there. Welcome to the Bronx and, and all that kind of stuff. Sophia, just to um, wrap this up. Um, Yes. Do, do you do you have um, other projects in mind? Or like, where's the next mural? You're going to come to my neighborhood and do something at the <laughs> library building or something? I mean, what do, what do you got? I, What's I going do, on? I do. I do have a mural um, that's going to pop up in Brooklyn. It's actually already installed. Um, I can't mention the location yet, but no literally, problem. if anyone oh, if it's follows in Brooklyn, my Instagram, I am with paint. I'll share when we're going to celebrate that. But in Bedside, Brooklyn, there's a new mural. Wow. That Beautiful. hasn't been celebrated yet, and I'm developing a body of work for a solo exhibition for the spring. Wow, that um, that and and you just never stop. This is what you do, right? You you yes. can't not be doing this. I, 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 I get yes. that sense. Yeah, um, Alicia. Um, and then the last thing I just want to say is to thank you and all the people at North Central Bronx. The work you do, work you all do, is so important. We need it so badly, and when it's done by great professionals like you and all your colleagues. Um, it, it, it helps keep the Bronx alive, literally and figuratively. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you for this project. Uh, and you. Sophia, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Uh, that will do it, uh, folks. We thank Leo, um, who was in our first segment and talked a little bit about the South Bronx and these folks who are um, really doing wonderful stuff in our borough. What a great place to borrow the Bronx. Uh, and so that's it. And if the curtain don't fall and the creek don't rise, we will be back next week. I guarantee you. Good night.